and uh, just the, the, getting into East Berlin in the air corridor. And suddenly, uh, an air, a yak was right in front of me. And I just pulled up in time. Uh, I came out of the cloud, and the yak was in the clear right on this side of the cloud. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Good evening. The stunning overthrow of Mikhail Gorbachev by communist hardliners dominates the news this Monday. Gorbachev was reported under house arrest as Soviet tanks took up positions throughout Moscow. To this small, feeble, kind Poland's military leader, General Jaruzelski, urged the Polish people tonight not to demonstrate on Tuesday, the second anniversary of the founding of the banned trade union, Solidarity. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Today we speak with 98-year-old Gail Halverson, who flew in the Berlin airlift in 1948. The Soviets had started an 11-month land blockade against West Berlin and this blockade was broken by a massive US and British airlift of vital supplies to West Berlin. Gail tells an incredible story of an iconic humanitarian mission at the dawn of the Cold War. Now, if you'd like to support us with a few dollars, pounds or rubles, then head over to coldwarconversations.com and click on the support the podcast menu option to learn more. Thank you so much to all our fans that are supporting us. It is really appreciated. If that's not your cup of tea, then you can really help us by leaving reviews on iTunes or with your favourite podcast provider. This really helps to raise our profile and get guests on the show. Now back to today's episode. The line wasn't great, but I felt so honoured to be able to speak with Gail why did you want to join the Air Force in particular? I, well, I always uh, wanted to fly. And, of course, I got my wings with the Civil Air Patrol uh, and got a pilot license before the war started. So I, uh, I raced on the farm and uh, working with the horses. And we didn't have a tractor. And I always wanted to do something better. And the airplane would fly from... Salt Lake City, right over our farm, on the way to Idaho, and then I'd stop to my work and watch that airplane so it disappeared. And then when they announced the program to to uh, get a pilot license, boy, we took a grad school, the local high school, Bear High School, and at the end we took the pilot license test, written test for the license, and they gave ten scholarships. Boy, I memorized everything. I got number six scholarship. Right, right, and and so then uh, your your train and part some of your training is with the Royal Air Force, I believe. Yes, my final military my military training to get wings was the RAF. I I was selected when I was half, halfway through the program to be the commanding uh, student officer. To run the parades and everything else. Of course, the parades were different. The marching is different with the RAF. They swing their wings back and forth. I mean, their arms. <laughs> and and uh, in the military, we just went, moved a little bit forward and back. But anyway, I, I was the, the student uh, officer for the uh, the British cadets, and that was kind of, that was interesting. Well, I followed very uh, interesting you know, all the news of the day that got us uh, finally joining the, the, the war with helping Great Britain. And uh, I, that's why I got interested in the flying. I didn't want to be a guy on, uh, on the ground. Those guys were my real heroes. And I, I wanted to fly, and, and that's how I got started flying before the war started with a civilian pilot training program that uh, I got the uh, scholarship with nine other guys for a pilot pilot license in right. Utah. Okay. Okay. And what did you know about Berlin before you got there? 
I was uh, in thrall of uh, the Berlin and the western part of Berlin and was a focal point for the contact with the Soviet Union. And uh, I followed that very closely and and then to have a chance to to uh, to go there to fly it was the uh, answer to my my, my curiosity and well, I always wanted to, to do something like that and, and now was the opportunity so and I joined the Air Force and volunteered to fly the airlift. Okay, and and what was your first flight like into Berlin? Well, I heard some of my buddies had been there, uh, took off, the weather wasn't good. We had radar on the ground in Berlin to help bring the airplanes into the landing field in bad weather. And I had a lot of experience flying radar in foreign transport operations before the airlift blockade. And uh, so I came, it was a cloudy day, and I came across, couldn't see much of East Germany. When I got over East Germany, and the radar picked me up and and uh, brought me down in stages, and uh, all of a sudden, out of the clouds, came this remains of the capital of Germany, the ruins, I don't know where you could see, there was, a, there was just ruins from the bombers that helped bring the war to an end. But it was a disaster aside for the proud city of, of Berlin. And uh, it was, I just wanted, I couldn't believe that there were still, still over two million people down there in West Berlin that was depending on us for what they're going to have for breakfast or supper or anything at all. So it was a purpose. I never felt such a purpose in my assignment as I did flying food in the people of Berlin. Right. And did you, uh, were you worried about Soviet aircraft intercepting you? Oh, yes. We didn't know whether they would pull up uh, soon enough or run into us head on. And uh, I was, we were concerned with that. Uh, we didn't know how good their pilots were. But uh, that was kept us uh, on our toes, and we'd see a, a Soviet fighter coming. But uh, they maintained that uh, uh, I never was very felt like I was going to get hit with a Soviet fighter. They uh, they eluded us pretty well in the quarter. But there was a concern we didn't know, and they didn't fly much on instruments. So when the weather was bad, which is a lot of time, we weren't concerned so much for the Soviet's interception. It's on clear days that we were watching carefully for them. Right. And what what was your most dangerous incident flying into Berlin? Well, early, early on in the, uh, during the, the operation, uh, I, uh, we had, uh, well, of course, there were a lot of clouds in Berlin. It, it, it just uh, is a city not known for a lot of sunshine in fact a few months in the winter in the summertime but uh, it was coming uh, in the cloud and uh, just the, the getting into East Berlin in the air corridor and suddenly uh, an air uh, yak was right in front of me and uh, just pulled up in time uh, I came out of the cloud and the yak was in the clear right on this side of the cloud so it kept me awake we didn't sleep much on the quarter in the Berlin. Yeah, no, I, I, I can imagine. And and when you landed in Berlin, um, what what happened then? I mean, uh, the the was it German workers that were unloading the aircraft? No, absolutely. They had a, 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 the Berliners were the heroes on the ground there. They were just they had always had a team waiting for to unload the airplane and. Uh, they would, they would get that coal, fill an awful lot of coal to keep them warm in the wintertime, and, and flour to eat. And they, they unload those, uh, those bags of flour and coal and, and, uh, and, and get us out of there quickly. And, and they had a good relationship with them. They'd wave to us and, and uh, work like mad uh, while we were on the ground to, to unload our, our special cargo for them. 
Right. And what, how did you find Berlin at the time? I mean, did it, you, you had some, some time off from flying and you were able to, to see Berlin? Yes. I, after uh, uh, a few weeks, I, I finished flying three round trips. We'd fly three round trips. And I'd fly, flown through the night and uh, finished my round, three round trips uh, uh, the next morning about 7 o'clock. And instead of going to bed, I, I told my crew chief and my co pilot if you guys go to bed, I'm going to Berlin. I'm going to hitchhike to Berlin. So all I had was a flight uniform on. The next flight out, I said, you want an extra passenger, an extra pilot? I said, sure, come aboard. No problem. And uh, I'd have a movie camera with me, took movie, movies on the ground, uh, watching the, the unloading process and the people teamed up on the ground. So I got some great movies of the airplane the operation on the ground and in the air in Berlin and uh, also West Germany. Right. And um, how how did you find the Berlin population? I mean, the, I, th- I think you, you met some children, didn't you? Oh, yes. Uh, the adults uh, were unloading the airplanes. And uh, they'd uh, come in with a load and... Uh, yeah, we wouldn't even be out of the cockpit. They come in the, the front entrance of the airplane in the back entrance and, and, and walk by there and just give us a high sign. You just, it, it, I never, ever felt uh, overtaxed uh, because of the wonderful reception. And the kids, uh, that's where the, the, the joy came. Uh, I hitchhiked to Berlin the first time and <clears throat> after flown three round trips and got and ended up in the daytime, hitchhiked back, and no problem getting it right in. They were back, uh, and uh, got my ration, all the ration of candy. I had anxious parachutes on it. And I, I told the kids when I was there that I gave them what I had, but I told them, yeah, you watch the airplanes coming in, and, and I'll be getting more candy and dropping parachutes. And they were really excited about it. Said, well, how do we know what airplane you're in? Every three minutes, there's an airplane landing at one of these three airports. And uh, how are we going to tell what airplane you got the chocolate? And then I remember back in when I got my pilot license before the war, I'd come over to Garland, Utah, and wiggle the wings of my airplane. And I dropped a few parachutes in. I said, you just watch the airplanes when they come over the top of the airfield before they land and go around. And watch the ones that wiggle the wings. Back and forth, and that's got the that's got the stuff in it. Just watch that one, and so it was a, a long time, a quite a long time, before my other buddies got got involved in dropping too. Right. Uh, what what did your commanders say when you first started doing this? Well, he <clears throat> came back from Berlin one day, and, and uh, uh, Colonel uh, uh, met me and. I said, Harvison, what have you been doing over Berlin? I said, flying like mad, sir. And he says, I'm not stupid. He said, what else have you been doing? And he got the report from the German government, the kids. And he says, well, Harvison, I thought I was going to get court-martialed. He said, I did it without permission. I didn't think I'd get permission in time to, to drop it. When I told the kids, I'd drop it. I, I knew I could get permission in time. That's why I did it without permission. And so uh, he said, well, that's a good idea, Alverson. Keep doing it, but keep me informed. So he supported me fully. And I had the support of everybody there. And my buddies were dropping them. We put a, a map in operations in Berlin where we dropped the last load. And so we moved it all around. We dropped, dropped it all, even in the British sector, the French sector. We dropped mostly in the American sector, but... We also dropped a good bit in the French and the British sectors. The kids wrote letters. We weren't dropping enough there, so we dropped a little more. So it was it was fun to get the reaction of the kids. Kept us going. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Did did the British drop any um, candy, or was it just the Americans that yes, were doing? Yes, I it? think the the Brits did some too. I never did get a final report on how much they did drop. 
I think everybody joined in. I didn't hear much from the French, but the Brits did it too. And uh, it was it was a it was a big operation. It dropped over 24 tons in the sky, and uh, that was a lot of. A lot of parachutes, I'll tell you that. Wow, twenty twenty four tons of candy is is a yeah. is a lot yeah. is a lot of candy during the whole airlift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now well, we kept good track of the Americans. Did. Yeah. Now um, I was looking at your story, and and there's an interesting story um, about a little girl called Mercedes Simon. Could you could you tell me that oh, story? Yes. yes. Well, a little girl wrote me a letter. She says, look, you're scaring our chickens. She's about eight years old. You're scaring our chickens. You're flying right over our chicken coop pretty low, and they're losing their feathers, and they're not getting them back, and they're not laying them any eggs anymore. And that's a problem during the early when they got a stuff blocked in. And then she had a map. She says, but when you, when you come to Berlin, and she gave me a good map with the radio, with the radio fixes and stuff, and when you come over to my house and you had a a map exactly where her house was and how to tell the sign it was by an old bomb drop castle. And she says, when you come over to my house, drop it there. I don't care if it scares them. Well, I couldn't find the chickens, but I dropped it in the general location. And she wrote me and says, I got it. I got it today. And I, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So we we kept dropping. We got to an old Mercedes and and many years later, uh, the Air Force, I stayed in the Air Force. They sent me back to Berlin to be the commander of Temple on Berlin for four years, 1950-54. And I met Mercedes again then. And uh, I had the letters that the kids had written me, and they're grown up now. And, and I uh, was able to contact a lot of them. And it was really you know, a wonderful reunion. Four years, the longest the commander been in Temple Hoff before since the end of the war was 17 months. That's a, it was a big job. And at night, going out to talking to different parts of the city and running the air base both day and night. And uh, I, I, that's when I met Mercedes and a lot of the kids are all there. It was a fabulous experience to go back and have them in our home in, uh, in West Berlin. Wow, that must have been very moving. Meet, meeting them. Came the states, came to the states, and stayed for a month with her family. After the airlift was over, quite a, a couple of years after the airlift was over. Wow, I've I've read some of the uh, kids' letters on your website, and uh, they're they're very moving, very powerful. Yeah, it was it was a great experience. Yeah. Um, how what how did it feel like like going going back as the commander at Tempelhof in in the nineteen seventies? I mean, how Berlin had changed well, a lot since then. Was, yeah, oh yeah, it, it was a totally different situation. Uh, but uh, the, the the joy I got from my mother meeting the kids one after another that had grown up, brought their children. Uh, to visit with me, and uh, it was an incredible uh, feeling of, of joy of the service that uh, that brought them freedom, and uh, <clears throat> that was the main thing. It, it, uh, West Berlin is the heroes. They said, we don't care how much we get to eat. We don't want to be taken over by the Soviets. We'll do anything. Just give us enough to stay alive. That was the attitude. And when people have that kind of an attitude, you don't mind flying day and night. No, and the, and the Soviets were offering them food, weren't they, which they didn't accept. Oh yeah, they said we'll we'll give you more rations and that, but they the Berliners had enough of the Soviets. They, they didn't expect anything from them, and and uh, never did get anything. Yeah, and I I understand that you you did some. Uh, reenactments of the uh, the candy drops as oh, well. I, I, I don't know how many I've done, but I've gone back year after year, and uh, and uh, well, not as much lately, but for years uh, I've done, done several in Utah, uh, a number of them in Utah, and 
and uh, in in Berlin, and uh, Albania, even in Albania, Micronesia, and Afghanistan. So I've had a, but I, I, I we may just, then my buddy started doing it, when the general said it's okay, keep it going, then the whole organization, could, we had a whole organization of doing up the parachutes, tying them onto candy bars, and putting them in bags and ready to drop. So we, we had a lot of support, a lot of support. But I have done the drop since then in, in Berlin and Albania, Camp Hope, Micronesia, and Afghanistan. But, uh, it's been a, been, a, been a wonderful time after that. It's kept going. Right. And, you, and you're using that to, to promote goodwill in other countries, I understand. Exactly. Exactly. I know it was, it was not the kids that you know, did Hitler's things, the Willie and Lee, and, and uh, that's where that's where he concentrated on. And then the, the parents, uh, sometimes mostly single, many times single parent families because of the war, and the, and the mothers of the little kids that were catching the candy, looking at great letters and how much they appreciated the, the goodwill it brought them. How it changed the mind of their their children about the, what the Americans were like. Right. Yeah. No. Ab- absolutely. Um, is is there anything else you'd like to say to to our audience um, about your your work and your you know philosophy about life? <clears throat> well, I think the, the thing I'd like people to remember is how much uh, uh, how much they should prize their freedom. Like having Great Britain and the United States, and uh, and uh, what people will go through to try. They had the West Berliners that had a, uh, enough of the, the British and Americans and French uh, presence, and how they approached the former enemy to, to, to really think highly of them. And uh, uh, one of like the young people today is uh, don't don't. Uh, don't dismiss somebody because you, you don't think they're, they're worthwhile. Uh, you'd be surprised what good ideas they have. Uh, you don't have to be their best friend, but you, you, your attitude. So there are a couple of qualities of personality that, that I always leave, especially. Attitude. Attitude will put your footsteps on the path of the, where you end up in life, how your attitude is. And you get a bad, bad spell like with Berlinella. You know it can come to an end if you put your foot into it, but attitude. Attitude is one of the most important things you can have in your journey through life. The second quality of character that I emphasize is gratitude. Gratitude, be grateful. Show you express your gratitude. Tell your family you're grateful for what they do for you. Look for chances to tell somebody whether it's a city councilman or anybody else, are grateful when they do something good. Give them, give them feedback. So you know, act in gratitude. And, and the, the third leg of this tool is putting service before self. If you want to have experience real joy, then, uh, then again, help somebody who needs it. Be, be aware of somebody that's in in trouble for some help and, and, and help when they don't expect it. You get more reward than you will with money. And uh, uh, this is thinking outside yourself, getting outside yourself on behalf of someone that's not as fortunate as you are. But those qualities of life are the, are the, are the foundation of all the talks that I give. And if you want to be happy in life, these are the four things that, that, uh, that you can pursue and do it and make, make the world a better place for yourself and others to do others do. Well, Gail, I think there's there's lessons in there for, for all of us and I really appreciate you um sharing your thoughts there. I I feel really honored that you've shared your story with me. Um it, it's you know, I've known about you for, for some time, but to actually speak to you in person and hear your story 
through your own words is is really powerful and you know i'd i'd like to thank you for your service but that just seems like a an, an understatement for what you've done um you know for your country and what you've done for other people as well well i'll tell you it's a pleasure to talk with someone with a british accent <laughs> i really enjoyed the, your comments and uh, I learned a lot of this, lived with them. I was one of their student, their student leaders. And I know those Brits were, were something else. I tell you, those young guys learning how to fly, and, uh, and it's wonderful. Uh, God bless you in your, in your efforts and to bring the peace and solidify the relationship we have with, the, with Great Britain and the United States. It's priceless. And, indispensable in today's world. It's really an honor to talk to a bit again and, uh, and to know that you're keeping us this alive, uh, this relationship between our two countries. So essential to such a you know, divisive modern world. And these kind of things are priceless. You're, you're very right there. Um, I think the, the honor's more mine. Well, that's all we have time for, but I hope you enjoyed hearing from Gail. Don't forget to visit the show notes at coldwarconversations.com where there's videos, links and details of books that will help you discover more about today's episode. If you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where some of our guests and listeners like yourselves continue the Cold War conversation. Just go to our website, coldwarconversations.com and click on the Join the Conversation option. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.